moving items and valuables is hard sometimes. So yes, having cash is very important, but if you think about it and you have time to prepare and you know the destination where you're going, sometimes having the cash or having the right. or something like already there or in yeah. parts of there, not necessarily on your person because you might be in a situation where you have to run for it and you don't have time. But you touched on goals. So now I have to ask, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> my viewers are really like um, the objectively uh, objectivity and the freedom that owning yeah. precious metals give you so what was the um, sort of utility or um, uh, what was the practice of possibly owning precious metals uh, back in Argentina during the collapse were people trading with it uh, were people storing value how did you view it and how what was your knowledge distilled from that experience brought into a modern perspective could you please talk about that yeah well as you as you explained there's several things you, you learn along the way um, one of the things i learned eventually when, when when i left argentina was that silver is quite heavy so if you acquire a lot of silver and you find yourself running with the silver it, I mean, and yeah, sure, it's a nice thing to have. Oh, I have so much silver that it's weighty, it's you know heavy, but silver is heavy. Silver, just a few bucks of silver can be quite heavy. So one of the, the things I've learned over the years is, you know, if it gets to that point, you want to, you know, maybe focus a little bit more on gold, which is a lot more compact and, you know, a more condensed uh, wealth. Uh, that's That can be, I mean, I... By the time I left Argentina, they had dogs sniffing in airports for dollars. Wow. They had dogs actually not trained for bombs or drugs, but sniffing people for money, you know. And I was sweating like a pig, thinking I have the cash here, I have metal here. And, you know, some, if I had had more, more of that in, in gold, it would have been lighter. Um, but yes, uh, when, when the economy started going, you know, coll well, the economy fully collapsed in, People, again, the difference is in, in Argentina, they don't have the same culture of precious metals like in the U.S. In the United States, there's a lot of people that understand what junk silver is. I mean, it's not everyone. And there's a famous video of a few years back of, of a guy offering people like a, a gold coin or a sneaker, sneaker bar. And people don't even understand the value of gold. They want a sneaker, the, the candy bar, because they don't get it. You know, they don't understand. Um, I think and, I remember that viewing that that he was either a silver bar or a candy. Oh, okay, bar. a silver, yeah, okay, yes. a silver coin. Yeah. And people took this the candy, so that's yeah. And that was in the U.S., where supposedly the knowledge yeah, sure. about precious metals should be even better because they enjoyed so much wealth from you know the last uh, couple. And, of and it's also a, a cultural thing. I mean, people are very aware. Of, well, not everyone, as you're just saying, and you know. Yeah, it, but there's still this idea of the the, the pre sixty five coins were silver. Mm. You know, up up until not that long ago, that, that those were silver coins. So right. there's yeah. there's some of that still, and you know, sure, maybe a little bit of the older generation. But those people exist in Argentina. There's no junk silver. It's mm -hmm. you know that that's that simply does not exist. Um, but in spite of that, people did sell jewelry, jewelry gold that was very typical that they, the wedding bands, you know, like the, the wedding band that you have, a lot of people would end up selling that for, for just a bit of money just to get by. Uh, people became quite dead. There was bartering going on, which is not as effective or as cool as some survivalists and preppers would like it to be. It's not nearly as effective and, and, and practical. Finding someone willing to trade for exactly what you have to offer um, but yeah, the business of, of precious metals went up, you know, the, the selling of gold and uh, buying and selling of gold went up like 500%, wow. uh, an, an increase of 500% during the, the, the first year after the collapse. Um, but again, there wasn't all that much to go around, but people did sell jewelry, you know, and one of the differences is that in, in Latin cultures, especially because of the Spanish and Italian influence, there's a lot of this going on of you know, for your first communion, for your baptism, you always get some kind of gold. I think it's the same in Eastern Europe, like a little bit of gold for some of these religious events or, you know, first communion or first birthday. So you have some sort of jewelry that it's in, in the past, it was intended as something of value, you know, if, if you ever have to trade it. Um, so that uh, did happen quite a bit. I also, um, my wife, she has a, a little break, uh, what used to be a necklace 
And the story goes in her family that after World War II, they would just remove little links of the chain and sell it you know, in, in, the, in the town for whatever it is that they needed. And by the time they made it to Argentina, that long necklace became like a, a bracelet. And she wow. still has a, a bracelet. That's a very cool story. What a story, wow. So all those little uh, lost uh, links were used to actually buy stuff when, when it was needed. I think it has a lot of, of importance. You know, I also like the idea of Bitcoin. Some people don't like it as much. I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it has its value. So my suggestion in general is putting eggs in different baskets. Have a little bit here, there. But of course, nothing replaces having an actual bar of silver or a gold coin or even a gold ring in your actual hand than you know, pretty much anything else. It's been that way for thousands and thousands of years. It's not gonna be changing anytime soon. So when uh, bartering picked up or did it, mm. it didn't necessarily happen in precious metals because that would be no. probably uh, more something that you would try to keep mm. it till last moment, right? Yeah. Um, what type of bartering, what were some good bartering items if that happened or the bartering mm. did not work at all during these times? What is your experience? No, it, it, it did work and it kept some people through those hard times. It, what I always try to explain is it's, it's not as cool or as effective or as practical as people wish it was. You know, people will always say, oh, this is going to be worth its weight in gold when... No, the only thing that's worth is it's weight in gold is gold. Forget about anything else. Or uh, I have this this shortwave radio. This is gonna be worth sure if you're caught in Nazi Germany and Second World War and you're, but that is a, a very or, or you know, buy you have cigarettes or liquor. You know, cigarettes are important in jail. Okay, are you in jail right now? No. Well, then it may not apply to you as 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 you think. A, you would see people, you know, what they started was these barter clubs. And even these days, I, I think they're still going on or they have, because Argentina is yet again going through very hard times. Uh, so some of these things started um, very popular, like, like children's clothing, toys, you know, even food. Food is always a, a huge thing. Look, in Venezuela, if you have a very, very sad situation over there, but I have to mention it because it's one of those examples. In Venezuela, you know, a can of of food. It's basically like a like a like, like a almost like a little a silver coin or or even more than that. Um, a can of tuna, for example, protein in in a place. Uh, Keeping look for uh, people in Venezuela, the average salary is like a couple dollars a month if you convert it, and that's the same of a can of tuna. It goes for the same price. Um, the, the the women in Venezuela and 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 Cuba, unfortunately, they find themselves you, you know having to offer themselves for food for their children. They will do that for a, a tin of, of tuna or a pack of food, literally, you know. And that's just the human desperation of not having food to put on the table, not only for themselves but for their kids, for their small kids, their families. So one of the things that would be valued the most by far food, food would be the thing um, back in for 2001, it was, you know, a mixture of this sort of thing, food, clothing, and pretty much everything that you have, you would, people would sell stuff or um, even offer services. It was, it was fairly common for some of these uh, barter clubs that became even you know, larger events. Uh, if you were like, for example, offering plumbing services, you would get a, a few coupons of the barter club, which was like a, a parallel currency. So you would offer your, even, I don't know, it was like um, is, is, is psychiatrists or you know, sessions, you know, shrink sessions, uh, people that were professionals offering their services for some of these coupons because you didn't have anything else. Uh, as soon as people could move to cash, they did. Um, but that was a way of, of getting through. These days, I think it's mostly clothing, food. That would be the, the big things uh, to keep in mind. Anything else could be valuable. Usually don't expect it to be as worth its weight in gold as people assume. Right. <clears throat> That's familiar to us in Romania. It would be a scene where people in the waiting room waiting for the doctor's uh, appointment mm -hmm. would have live chickens with them in right. the waiting room, and that would be the pay or um, <clears throat> bags of potatoes 
you know, we grew potatoes back then. But, um, you know, my father-in-law, he worked on cars and, you know, he, he would tell the stories how would uh, one, wor one day worth of, worth of job was um, paid in two sacks of potatoes, like the right. five pound <laughs> sacks, right? Right, um, right. And that would, that would be normal and they would be happy to even receive that. So Correct. there's our levels of this and it can go very dark, very fast. So we don't want to necessarily take it there, but um, you know, wise, wise words to have food and have preparedness on the mind. Now, with that said, if I give you a time machine, you know, I'm a fan of... Um, time yeah. traveling movies and so on <laughs> uh deloreans hopefully or some nice cars uh, if i would give you a time machine and you could go back you know six months prior when the collapse happened in argentina mm. what how would you use those and let yourself know right and then you come back how would you use those six months to prepare right what right. A, give me five things that would you do and this is cheat mode on so you can yeah. have anything that you had back then and yeah do and prepare give me your five or ten steps uh, that you would uh, tell yourself well i would tell myself to buy bitcoin a lot of it <laughs> that would be a very simple that would be a a, a no-brainer right that would be obvious um but then, yes, you know, if I did that, I would tell myself do that, um, and that's why I, I I still feel very strongly about it, even though I do believe I not it's not I believe in Bitcoin. I understand the value of, of of gold and silver. That would be the best way of putting it, because gold and silver has been proven for thousands and thousands of years. Look, I have some denarius coins that are literally two thousand years old. They're still silver, of course. They have more of a numismatic value now than they have in terms of precious metals, but it's still silver. It's just that, that, that the precious metal is the insurance against everything else going to hell. Um, but um, yeah, that would be a, one of the other things. As of the rest, you know, man, leaving sooner, sure, maybe um, waiting a little bit too much, but at the end of the day, it also made me who I am right now. The experiences I've had going through that. That's yeah, fortunately I don't have all that many regrets, man. I, I've had a, a pretty awesome life, you know, wonderful wife, kids, and lived in different places and plan on living in more and enjoying everything I, I can to the fullest. So I've I've always been interested in many things that do relate to preparedness survival even as a 10 year old i got my first survival knife it was the cheapest most awful little chinese made knife in the planet but it was mine and i was happy with that later on i you know by the time i was 15 i was doing actual firearms training with you know serious a uh, firearms training for self-defense i was fortunate in, in that aspect as well because it's not all that common for someone at that age to go through that but I was I was lucky that I I did, um, and yeah, and I, I guess that you know leaving sooner would be, but you never know when it's the right moment. If you just do it too fast, you may end up regretting or thinking, oh maybe it wasn't necessary. Um, the thing is, if you just one of the things that kind of haunted us was all of these people that. It waited too long and bad things happened to them. You know, I lost count of how many people were thinking of leaving and they got shot coming back from the store or whatever. Or there was a, there was one that was very bad. A guy that left Argentina after the 2001 crisis, he moved to the United States, moved to us in 2001, lived, lived in, in America for 10 years. And he said, okay, I'm going to be going back and visiting family. The day he arrives to Argentina, goes to buy a pack of cigarettes and gets shot and killed on the street. And I was, oh my God, this guy, or uh, another one that suffered a horrible home invasion and, you know, they left the following month, but man, it's just too late. You already had your life destroyed. So, you know, those stories were always on the back of my mind. So I always had like a lot of precautions being, being as careful as I could be um, in, in terms of, of self-defense security has always been something I was interested in. So but at the same time, you get to a point where you're not enjoying life. I mean, if you're always with, if you're always with eyes on, on the back of your head and always looking to who you're going to be shooting in, in case things go wrong, you, it's not that you become paranoid, but you're not enjoying life all that much anymore because you're always worried about 
um, you know, we're waking up with the slightest little noise. <laughs> my, my wife uh, jokes that uh, you don't really wake up. Yeah, yes, y you, especially when you live like that, you do. And then you relax when you're in a, in a safer place, you relax and you, you let your, but uh, you know, for example, doing, doing this, um, I, I'm not all that comfortable. If I'm using, for example, my, my elliptic trainer, you know, working out a bit, I only use one, one headphone because I don't like the idea of not being able to listen if someone is trying to kick down the door. Even till this day, I, I, I don't feel comfortable doing that. You know, listening if someone is screaming, someone, you know, and it's all little details like that that normal people don't think of, but even years later, you just think of it this way, you know, checking your doors that they're locked. Um, yes, it's, it kind of becomes part of you, I guess. Well, you, you kind of touched some interesting <laughs> topics there, but um, very well put regarding the level of alertness that going mm. through these um, and myself as well, even as a younger person, much younger yeah. person during these times, it got embedded into the system. It got embedded mm. my alertness level to walk down the street. It could be a very fine street. It could be, you know, uh, sunshine and uh, roses, but it's still there, you know, because mm. that was my past in Romania as a young person to always have ears and eyes open. So, and that level of alertness does cause some different patterns of behavior that changes your whole life. Yeah. Like, and it's not, you know, it's not easy to live with that. You have to somehow incorporate that into your life. And, but, you know, when, someone was screaming down the street, uh, a lady in front of her house, you know, I was the first one thrown there and I didn't know what to expect, you know, but I was there. So, you know, with, with uh, then calling for backup. So it's not easy, you know, going through that, but um, it is what it is. And, uh, you know, being happy with your life helps a lot. So I like yeah. the, I like the answer you gave that you wouldn't change too much because then you would not be you. I absolutely yeah. love that because <laughs> this allows us to help other people, right? What we went through, this allows us to help other people. So hopefully, you know, in the long run, we can make some, uh, make some um, good thing out of it. You touched on another topic with uh, self-defense. So my personal opinion is that, um, you know, you need to your own, you need to know your own family, your own situation, uh, however, you know, you have to have a really good damn excuse not to defend yourself or not to be prepared for self-defense. But I understand it's not for everyone and you can have your personal opinions and we don't have to talk about that if you're a viewer. Uh, however, uh, there are some people who have reached out to me as well, and I'm pretty sure to others as well, that who are not interested in self-defense, who are not interested in the gong culture, are not interested mm. too much in training, However, then yeah. when they reached out and they can sense something changing, right? And they want some protection. What would be a good advice for them or just topics to think about? Because for some people who are not interested in training every, um, mm. every second week or something like that, what would be a good thing if they would want, um, you know, yeah. let's say a pistol or something like that, uh, um, just as a, as a fire extinguisher to have it there, yeah. Uh, just in case something happens, locked away safely, so that you know, no kids or anything like that could touch it, uh, making everything legal, everything okay, sure. just having yeah. that tool as a tool. Could you share a couple of words of knowledge for those people? Yeah, look, it's, um, as you're saying, and I've had the same experience in, in recent two, uh, years, I've had more and more, um, uh, an increasing amount of people that send me messages like, I'm not a gun person, look, I'm not you know, I'm not into all of this, but I'm worried. I'm worried about my family. What if, and, and the truth of, of the matter is even the, the most, the, you know, peaceful, loving person on the planet, the moment you have someone kicking down your door and uh, intended in harming you, you will want something to defend yourself. It's the basic human instinct. It's, it's a basic animal instinct that we all have, especially when you have a family. I think no, no parent would, would like to see their children harmed. Um, you know, if, if you can do anything about it. And yeah, very much like, like the fire extinguisher, unless you have it when you need it, it's no good. I mean, hoping you did something different when it's actually going down, it's not going to be changing what, what happens. Um, 
I I usually explain people, it requires a minimum amount of commitment if you're going to be getting a fire for self-defense. This is like you get a car and you don't know how to drive it, you know? Right. So I, I want to be able to visit my family. I want a car. Okay, you bought the car. Can you drive it? No, I have no clue how that's done. Okay, and then you really need to drive it, learn to how, how to drive the thing. I, I'm not, and again, a, a good similarity would be you need to know how to drive. And if you really enjoy it, you can, can become a, professional f1 driver sure we're just talking about at least know how to move the thing safely to one place well thing same thing goes here you need at least one class with a with a qualified instructor is going to be explaining you the legal aspect of all of this how to keep it safe in your house your environment keep in mind many of these accidents are from things that could have been pre usually when you think uh, in the the numbers of um of people that get hurt with a gun you know they you will usually hear, oh, oh, it's more dangerous to have a gun than not have it. Look, I have plenty of guns. I have kids and we're all quite safe. And it's no, no accident. It's not just because we're lucky. It's because I know what I'm doing here and I take the necessary precautions. And, you know, that's the same thing you want to do yourself. So get yourself proper training, which I had more than enough of. I suggest at least get up a, a class with a qualified instructor that's going to be explaining you what you have to do so as to keep a, a, a level of safety with all of this. Still, it is a firearm. There's a level of danger involved to it. So always keep that in mind and be responsible. As free adults, you assume your own responsibility for your choices. I think that's quite clear for all of us. If you want to be safe in these situations, then my advice for people that don't like firearms all that much is uh, you know, a, a revolver would be the typical thing I recommend for people like that because it's very simple, not mechanically simple because it's actually quite complex on right. the inside. It's not as durable as people think. Oh, yeah, that's what they use in the far west. Well, mechanically speaking, it's a lot of clockwork in there and it's quite fragile. But for people that are going to be using it a minimum amount and the, the, the user manual is very simple. And that's what you want as someone that's not going to be training a whole lot or actually very limited. It's a thing where you put the bullets in the cylinder, you close it, and the day you need it, hopefully never, but if you ever do, you can actually pick it up and pull the trigger. It's going to be going boom at least six times or so. And that is a lot better than trying to fiddle with a gun that you have no idea how it works. If you look at what police and military use all over the world, they use semi-automatics. But it goes along with a level of, of proficiency and muscle memory that if you're not interested in it, you're probably not going to be acquiring. Now, having said that, semi-automatic pistols are used all the time and quite efficiently so by people that haven't got a lot of, of training. But my personal advice would be, if you're not into this, the revolver is a good way to go. And I will also throw in this, it, it, throw in here the, this other aspect that if you it, give yourself a, um, a, a, a chance of actually trying of enjoying this because the best thing for you would be to get involved in some of the sports, which can be a lot of fun if you do it safely and, and you, you get the hang of it. It can be quite competitive at times and you're going to be using the same thing you see police use or, or military, the same firearms. And it's all very friendly with that community that you have, maybe meeting people locally. And this goes along with networking and meeting like-minded people. I mean, man, over the years in different countries, I've met some fantastic people because of this. You know, everything from doctors, lawyers, dentists, uh, people that work in, uh, in the military or, you know, all walks of life. And you have that in common and it's, it becomes part of your community, of, of your network of people that you can count on when it's needed. Very well put. I like the fact that you also say that it's important, and that's my opinion as well, to have that basic training, right? Because mm -hmm. um, if, if they say that is it's more dangerous to have it at home, yes, if you have no training, absolutely. But if you have training, it's just it becomes a tool. And what I don't necessarily like, and I don't want to go into this, and we won't, mm -hmm. but it it's being politicized, right? That yeah. it's 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 a left or right or center, whatever issue. It's a self-defense issue, right? It's, it's your right to protect yourself and your family. You don't have to be political one way or another. And of course, but do consider your family, uh, your situation, and um, you know, talk with professionals if it's something that you're, you're interested in. I do want to take you to the other side of the coin now a little bit, just a little bit. Um, for people who have uh, training, who enjoy uh, shooting, enjoy going to self-defense classes, However, I know 
that in a collapsed situation, a very fancy firearm, you know, that has um, the nicest brand, but it's somewhere produced in Belgium and you're probably <laughs> yeah. living it somewhere else. Um, you know, it's not, in my opinion, not, it might not be the necessarily best option for you to have. And I think uh, we have at least one thing in common. That's our, um, you know, um, our kind view to Glocks and <laughs> Glock ah, <yes>. pistols. <laughs> and could you tell uh, the viewers, and we don't want to feud or like, don't start typing <laughs> FN is much better or something like that. And we don't want to turn it into a gun video, but uh, for people who are interested, what yeah. are some options and why uh, are, are there some good options for um, in a situation when it's hard to get parts or hard to get, mm. uh, you know, ammunition, that sort of stuff. What are yeah. some advices for them to have, you know? Correct. Yeah, good point. Look, for people that want to keep it super basic, like a, a Smith & Wesson revolver or, or Ruger revolver, those are very good options. And 357 Magnum, great way to go. And you can use 38, which is lighter and not as, you know, not so much recoil. Now, for people that want to do what I recommend doing, which is, you know, get a little bit more involved in this, and it can be quite fun, especially the practical shooting sports, which is different from the target shooting that looks boring as hell, and I actually <laughs> hated myself, but the practical shooting is you're moving around, you're going like the John Wick movies, you know, we're doing reloads and all that fun stuff, and you're learning valuable skills and muscle memory. Um, that's different though. There's differences from that and proper self-defense, but the speed and accuracy is uh, an important element. And um, it, it is definitely more of a sport, but it, it can be quite enjoyable. The nice thing is you can use the same guns that you, you would be using for self-defense. And it's the same guns that it's used by the military and police, which as you're saying, Glock pistol is by far the most popular for military and police all over the world. And it's, it's for very good reasons. It's the most simple, reliable. Uh, if you combine simplicity, accuracy, reliability, ease of use, even for beginners, a, a beginner looking to get a pistol, the Glock is going to be the best option for him, no doubt. And for even for Navy SEALs, they use Glock themselves or Secret Service Glock as well. And they could go on listing the amount of special forces that use Glock pistol. But uh, a Glock 9 millimeter is as... Uh, as a fail proof as it gets it's super easy and you can you can use that same thing for sport shooting and those skills that you're going to be developing there can be quite useful if you're ever actually needed for for self-defense but uh, yeah it's a very reliable firearm and it's it's it has no external safeties to mess with while still being um, very safe with three internal safeties that are automatically released when you use it it's i think it's by far the the best you have a ton of different choices, but that is the one I use the most and the one I recommend as well. Agreed. Uh, absolutely agreed there. And if you're not a Glock fan, you know, in the comment section, that's totally fine. You can have your opinion. Yeah. We're just sharing opinions here. Um, so one thing, a comparison uh, would be in, in my, you know, uh, perspective we had these cars which in Romania which were made in Romania everybody yeah. had that same car it was actually a pretty bad car but everybody had the same car uh, right. and just the availability for uh, right. parts you know having two of the same cars even if it's not a, a very you know it's not a Lexus it was a Dacia yeah. 1310 was the model but everyone absolutely everyone had that right, because right. it was communism that was the one that was issued and you could fix it with a screwdriver right so and being that interoperability or having the same um, car twice one that you're actually using one is sort of half broken down but you had it for parts or something like that you know transferring that knowledge into other perspectives maybe it could be guns it could be other things as well but you know being making sure that it's something you know how to handle you know how to fix or so you know someone who knows how to fix is very important yeah. in in these situations um with that said regarding cars uh do you think people should have a bug out car or uh, something made that um, it's not too much, especially with the shortage and um, chips and that yeah. sort of stuff? Do you think it's a good idea to have maybe a car made in the 70s or 80s or something like that, uh, that maybe people start learning how to fix and uh, have that option as well? Because in the United States, people have you know, sometimes three, four cars in the driveway mm. and they're all the latest cars and they, who knows what the payments are on those. 
Uh, what is your opinion on <laughs> yeah. owning some older cars um, uh, in for these situations? Look, I'm no mechanic, so I'm sure someone watching this is, you know, has a, a car from the 70s or 60s and it's super simple and they love it. What I try to do is keep it as simple as possible, uh, but with a, a few caveats. Uh, based on my experience, I want something that has a minimum amount of ground clearance, so something is right. a little bit taller. And I definitely want a four by four or all wheel drive. You know, some people that are more off-roady will say, ah, oh, you don't need four by four, all wheel drive is, is not as good. Sure. But I want something that has traction on all four wheels, wheels at times when I need it. Um, and I also want something that's very reliable. And one of the things, I, if you want to have like a um, Land Rover Defender sorted out for bugging out and sure, go with that. Keep in mind, though, that you're most likely to be caught when you need it with your daily driver. Whatever it is you're driving daily, that's a good probability. You're going to be depending on that car when you need it the most. May that be a flood? May that be evacuation? So if you want to have a couple, by all means. But I would want to make my daily driver something that's super reliable and that it has these these options. Mine is a Honda CRV. It's a super reliable car. It's always top of the chart on reliability. It's always one of the most reliable vehicles. And there's some of those going with half a million miles on them and still going strong. So it's one of those cars that runs forever. Super simple. Most mechanics will know how to work with it. Uh, mine is diesel, which I like. You know, Diesel is not explosive and diesel runs longer and it's easier to store. Store as well, yeah. Much it is enough. not as popular in the United States, so that may be a thing to keep in mind. But if you can, diesel is a great option. It has more torque as well. I was caught in a, in a bit of a flood a few years ago. I think it was like a few years ago back. And yeah, I actually could tell that, you know, I was going uphill. I saw a lot of water coming down this, this street. The street became a little bit of a river and actually had some water going over the hood, which was quite scary. The, the car got me through that. I don't think, uh, and you know, the following day I saw a car that was completely trashed. It obviously got caught by the current and turned over numerous times, completely destroyed. So on these things, you want to have a bit of a big, and would a, like a Land Rover, a Defender be better? Sure. But is that a good daily driver or is that a, 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 a car that gives you mileage when you want to put miles between or, or you know a, a good distance between you and whatever threat if it's about covering a lot of distance you want something that's very very efficient not a huge engine that has a, a lot of, of power for shorter distances and going off-roading you're most likely going to be going through pavement most of the time anyway so the the need for off-roading is more about entertainment and fun than real bugging out um but it also depends on where you live and such yes, but exactly you know, living in 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 a in a place where there was a quite a bit of snow, I had some of my neighbors with their fancy BMWs and Audis going sliding down the street because it was all ice. And I went with it was a, a bit of an older CRV, but also a Honda. In mind would just go up without any problem, and any 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 little thing I had, I would deal with quite quite well, no problem. Doesn't always has to, has to be the fanciest, most expensive. Uh, you know, off-road vehicle in, in, in around so as to get you through it. Thank you very much. So um, would, would there be something that you would like to share with the audience uh, before you, uh, before we end the interview? Is there anything that you would like to say to them? Sure. You know, my channel and books, I always recommend them, obviously, because of obvious reasons, I wrote them myself. But you know, I think it's based on, I always try to keep a, a practical perspective of things. You, you were mentioning bushcrafting and such, and I, I love that stuff as well. Now, is it really all that practical about how many people starve to death in the woods or froze to death? Every once in a while it happens, it usually ends up making it in the news because it's the person that died in, you know, in a, in a very long time. You're very unlikely to find yourself living off the land in the middle of the Amazons after a plane crash. It has happened before, but it's really not all that common. And um, what I'm going at here is that there's a lot of practical things that you can do so as to prepare realistically, um, especially these days where, where things are getting more complicated you really want to focus on practical stuff. You know, it used to be that this was all just 
you know, more a matter of fun or watching on TV, man versus wild and fantasize about jumping into a river and floating with, uh, with your jeans or whatever. Um, it, it's getting to the point where it's really important to do this for real and be very practical about it uh, because we're really going to some complicated times. At least it's, that's the way I see it. Well, I'm looking forward to reading your book, Street Survival Skills, and also Modern Survival Manual. Um, so thank you very much for coming on. I will have a link uh, to his uh, YouTube channel, The Modern Survivalist, so uh, feel free to check it out there. Fernando, thank you very much for coming on. I really appreciate it, and thank you for sharing all this knowledge with us. Thanks. It was great having this conversation with you, and whenever you want to do it, we can do it again. Thanks, and see you next time.